I'm from touch football in parking lots and street corner Romeos. I'm from half brothers and three quarter Nelsons. I'm from watered down blue blood and finger painting on subway walls. I'm from tongue kisses in stairwells and tequila sunsets in the closet. I'm from stealing the coins out of other people's wishing wells. I'm from Jordash jeans and pickup games in the twilight. I'm from Italian girls wearing murmurs I oh so badly wanted to speak. I'm from sidestepped obligations and nomadic fingertips. I'm from Listerine in alleyways and whiskers in the Vaseline. I'm from unreliable narrators and abandoned buildings. I'm from don't cross 24th Street because of the Irish and don't cross South Street because of the blacks. I'm from the merry-go-round where white guys in cars slow down after midnight to take a visual bite out of my 12-year-old ass. I'm from fuck you when my friends are around and please stop looking at me, please stop looking at me, please stop looking at me when I'm alone. I'm from sucker punches and a mouthful of blood spit in my face. I'm from a nightgown breathing at the bottom of a staircase. I'm from I wish you died in that hospital. I'm from exit plans that involve shotguns. I'm from you're going to front like the hard guy. You better back that shit up. Okay. Um, uh, that's a poem called Origins about growing up in Center City, Philadelphia in the late 70s, early 80s, a time when cities across America were run down. So a few years ago, I decided to write a book about that neighborhood, kind of an alumni notes for a street corner. 22nd and Lombard. That corner was a kind of socioeconomic vortex. One block to the south, and the whole neighborhood went from white to black, and the value of houses dropped in half. Three blocks to the west, and everything became Irish. Two blocks northeast, and it got increasingly affluent, where I lived, and you hit the merry-go-round, where guys with late-night crews in their cars this was pre-AIDS, pre-crack, pre-automatic weapons. I never saw an Uzi or a Glock. But I saw plenty of nunchucks, box cutters, switchblades, antennas, broken bottles, a BB gun, even a long fluorescent bulb broken and used like a poor man's lightsaber. The kids in Center City who came from good families, they were sheltered and stayed in. But those of us from broken homes, regardless of the income level, we couldn't take the family tension, so we had to get out. So anyway, the plan for this book was perfect. I'd sit down with my oldest friend in the world, Drew O'Leary, and my two younger brothers, and our other friend Cree, with some cheesesteaks, hoagie in a backyard, and let the stories rip. Hours after hour of crazy ass Philly conversation. Our memories playing off of one another's, an audio recorder picking up every syllable. From when I was 10 years old to 13, the five of us were practically inseparable. But Drew was the one I knew the longest, even longer than my younger brothers. We went to nursery school together. Our mothers became best friends right after we were born. Our moms were both Irish and grew up working class, both very pretty, well-dressed, and both had made it out of their ethnic neighborhoods and into Center City, one of the two fancy neighborhoods in Philly. Drew used to come to my house when he was four and I was five and we would play as our mom sat downstairs. We didn't know they were sipping wine with prescription Valium in their purses. He was a little rowdier than me, always jumping on me and wanting to wrestle. I was only five and not writing poems, obviously. But I did know how to use my imagination to my advantage. I convinced Drew that there was an alligator in my bedroom closet. And whenever he got out of line, I would walk over and grip the wooden knob. And his dark eyes would tense up. And his big rambling smile would tremble into silence. After a while, all I had to do was look at the knob from across the room. And a little color would leave his face. 
Maybe that was my first lesson in the power of words. He was a fast runner with chocolatey brown hair, a barbed tongue, and high cheekbones. He was a good-looking kid, so much so that his mother got him work as a model for Sears and J.C. Penney, and he got paid to appear in their catalogs. After his parents' divorce when he was nine, his mom would send him around the corner to his dad's apartment to get the monthly child support check. And often his dad wouldn't give it to him, and his mom wouldn't let him back in the house till he had the check. And he'd go back and forth, back and forth, finally showing up at our front door, damp-eyed, gnawing his lip. By 1978, when I was 11 and Drew was 10, about the time the picture was taken, he's the one on the bottom right. Our home lives were becoming unbearable. So me, him, and my two younger brothers and the kid named Cree began roaming the neighborhood looking for mischief breaking into abandoned buildings and stalled construction sites and making them our playgrounds where we played elaborate games of hide and seek. Climbing a fire escape onto a townhouse roof and hurling discreet snowballs at people standing in line to see Kramer versus Kramer and practically levitating with glee as the grown-ups looked around clueless as to where the attack was coming from having run-ins with the local Irish gang, the Taneys, who always seemed to outnumber us, playing hours and hours of football in Rittenhouse Square and eventually basketball in schoolyards, hanging around an arcade named Wizards, where older kids called us five preteens the Canobbins and sold us weed, and in the summer hanging on the front steps of Gary Close's house and Lee Ruzzi's on the corner of 22nd and Lombard. When we became teenagers, I began carrying a notebook with me everywhere and filling it with poetry. We'd be getting stoned with other latchkey kids on South Street, and I'd hear Drew whisper, Yo, my buddy Jeff is a little weird. He writes poetry, but he's still cool. As if me writing poetry was a kind of social disease. It took us each five years in three different schools, but eventually we graduated high school. I went to college in New York and Drew went to school in Virginia. Over breaks, we'd hang in Philly, go out to dive bars and nightclubs, and, and inevitably be pinned around the 3 a.m. Coke mirror. He sprouted into a big guy and became a serious baller, six foot two with broad shoulders, and he'd get physical when he drank, wrapping a paw around you, slapping you on the back in a way that made you wonder. Is he being overly friendly or straight up antagonistic? But he was a loyal and generous friend. And he was always gentle with me. He looked up to me. He had, had ever since we were kids. And I never really did abuse that, except for the alligator in the closet thing. <laughs> During grad school, I got mixed up in heroin, thinking it was going to help me write the great American poem. Instead, it landed me in 12-step meetings by the end of 1993. This meant I could only hang out with Drew during daylight hours, as his hard drinking and partying seemed to be not the best mix for my newfound sobriety. But we talked on the phone even as I moved to DC and then LA and ultimately back to New York. We both just knew we had each other's backs. He was the friend who answered the call when I needed something. He was the one friend there in 1987 to help my dad, my two brothers, and I move out of our four-story brownstone when my parents' marriage finally collapsed, like a boxer who'd been beaten and beaten for 18 rounds. He was the one friend there in 2006 when my mom was moving out of a one-bedroom walk-in up and into public housing for seniors. He maneuvered her sofa and boxes with his brawny arms down the compact stairwell. Now, the weird thing is, in terms of poetry, Drew went from being my apologist to being my biggest fan. He would call me up drunk late at night and read my own poems to me. And if I wasn't there, he'd leave them on my machine and he'd, he'd want to talk about them. He had all these sincere questions about what certain lines meant and untraditional interpretations. In the summer of 2012, I told Drew about my book idea about the old neighborhood. He said he, he should co-write it with me that he had a lot of stories I'd never heard, like stuff about him and some hell's angels who were dealing meth after he got out of high school and a week or two when he was living on the streets after his dad kicked him out. I kind of brushed him off and said, okay, we'll see. See, I didn't want to give up authorial control 
Plus, I had that perfect plan, you know, the five of us sitting around and talking. A couple months later, Drew called me in a frenzy. He said he wasn't sleeping anymore. He'd lost his good white-collar job. He's having a hard time getting a new one. Some arrests kept popping up on his background checks. He was lending friends to money, ripping through his savings. His dad had moved in with him. He was struggling to pay his mortgage, had a glove compartment filled with parking tickets, was on a steady diet of pot, coke, booze, and pharmaceuticals, and was thinking of suicide. I'd never heard him talk like that before. Gallows humor, yes. Straight up fear for his life, no. I mean, he had a remarkable ability to somehow hold it together, to wake up the next morning after a night of tremendous excess and will himself to work. Maybe it was because his mom used to always yell, no one in the world gives you anything. You got to work for everything. We talked about the 12 steps. He said he tried to go to meetings, but he couldn't just make it through the door. It didn't feel right to him. I said it hardly ever feels right in the beginning. I told him he could get sober if he just go to meetings. Instead, he went to the Bahamas to see an old friend from a boarding school he'd gotten kicked out of. We played a little phone tag when he came back. Then my fall semester teaching got October busy, and my daughter's sixth birthday was coming up. I didn't hear from him for a couple weeks. And truth be told, I didn't even think about him. Then I got a text on a Friday night from a guy in Philly who'd also hung out on 22nd and Lombard. Drew O'Leary is dead. The air left my chest. I didn't even know his mom's phone number anymore. Searching for any news, I looked at his Facebook page. For some reason, he switched his profile to a picture of us as kids, a group of us down in Cape May celebrating my 11th birthday. It wasn't clear for weeks if his death was an accidental overdose or a suicide or if his body had just given up after three decades of abuse. I drove down to Philly for the wake and funeral. I was asked by his family to deliver the eulogy. It was a big Irish church, a huge Catholic ceremony. Drew hated having to go to church as a kid. Probably would have pissed him off that the priests were getting the last word over his body, waving their magic wands, pouring their potions from chalice to chalice. He hated Sunday school and the priests at Bishop Newman, the high school in South Philly he eventually graduated from. But at least I got to speak. Standing there and delivering those words in front of several hundred people and him in the casket was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's embarrassing to admit, admit but I realized also that my perfect idea for the book had died with them. And to make matters worse, two of the other three main characters became unreachable. And there have been other failings along the way, including the machine not recording a day of at least three pretty good interviews. But I've been plugging along and things are happening. One chapter will be about Drew. Here's a poem I wrote for him. Dear Drew, there's a green leaf taped to my window. The red veins when hit by the sun look just like your arms. The morning we found you sprawled out on your futon like the astronaut who didn't get to go. Now you're rising out of your body like steam from a kettle. You used to say there ought to be red bloodlines and money so we would remember all the work it took to make it. A blue sealed baggie at your feet, sprinkles of moon dust in your mustache. Remember how we sat in my dark closet in first grade and pretended it was outer space, a place our dazed and lipsticked mothers couldn't reach? Maybe that's why we smoked so much mouse fur, to create an atmospheric barrier the genetic meteors couldn't penetrate. I can see you now in your rocket-shaped coffin, wearing an astronaut suit over pajamas with little race cars on your arms and legs. Happy cruising in the afterlife. Beware of mouse traps and intergalactic speed traps and parents with belts and older men with bourbon on their breath trying to sneak past the mouse trap in your pants. Rise like a high note from the opera singer's lips. Rise like the temperature when God holds a lit match to the thermometer's toes. Often the things that we love and lose have a way of achieving perfection in our minds. 
the favorite wool sock left in a hotel room, the handwritten poem you forgot in the pants you put in the washing machine, the girl you never kissed, the interview at the restaurant where you thought you finally captured your dad's true self on tape, the dead friend, the conversation you never got to have. These are perfections we all fall for, but part of making art and maybe even living is surrendering the ideal, even if only during the waking hours. <laughs>